In this video, I want to talk about predicate logic where you add identity or the identity symbol. We'll talk through what type of identity is being added, the symbols, syntax, semantics, derivation rules associated with identity, and how to translate some English sentences into the language of predicate logic with identity. So first, let's talk about the identity that we're introducing into the language of predicate logic. Typically, a distinction is made between two different types of identity. The first is qualitative identity. And a way of, rather than defining qualitative identity, it's helpful just to look at an illustration. So let's take two identical twins, John and Tech. And one thing we might note about these identical twins is that they share a lot of properties. They have the same parent, the same mother, the same hometown. They may look the same. They have maybe similar behaviors and so forth. This is not, of course, true of all identical twins. Uh, they don't all behave the same way. In addition, uh, sometimes people will talk about two identical twins as being the same. And you might talk about, you know, friends being the same as well or two people being the same. But here we don't actually mean that they are the same person. What we mean is that they share a lot of similar traits or properties. So we're clear when we talk about two people being identical twins or being the same, same in certain ways, we mean that they share properties rather than being one in the same person. In contrast is numerical identity. Now numerical identity is a little bit different. Now let's just take the individual tech all by himself. Certainly he's qualitatively identical to himself. Any sort of properties that Tech has is going to be similar to the ones that he has. Um, but Tech has a particular property that he, he alone has, that he doesn't share with anyone else. And this is the property of being identical with himself. So in the case of John and Tech, the two twins, they might share a lot of properties, but Tech has a property that John does not have, which is being the same person, that is being one in the same person. So when we talk about numerical identity, usually we are referring to a particular thing and its relationship it has to itself. And, this, and it's a particular relationship that it has that no thing else or no one else has. So the type of law identity that we'll be talking about here is numerical identity. Now, this particular topic of what exactly it means for two things to be numerically identical is a pretty deep and broad topic, uh, but I won't get that into that here. So the first thing to do is to talk about identity symbols. That is, we're going to introduce into the language a symbol to stand for numerical identity. This is pretty straightforward, but uh, there's kind of one preface to it. We can understand identity as a two-place relation. That is, it's a relation between one thing and another thing. And because it's a two-place relation, we can represent it using a two-place predicate. But rather than doing that, we're going to treat identity as a logical constant. In the case of predicates, its meaning can vary from model to model, depending upon the interpretation. But when we treat it as a logical constant, its meaning is stays fixed and so it won't vary from model to model. In introducing a particular symbol, what we'll do is introduce two different ones, one to represent identity and the other to represent non-identity. The symbols that we'll make use of here are the equal sign and the equal sign with a sort of slash through it to represent identity and non-identity. So now that we've introduced the symbol of equals to represent numerical identity and not equals to represent not numerically identical, it's now time to develop the syntax around it, the sort of grammar or ways we can put sim these symbols together in our predicate logic language to form well-formed formulas. We have an existing set of rules for forming well-formed formulas, and if you're unfamiliar with those, I'll put some links in the video below. But here what we want to do is sort of just simply add a rule to deal with these new symbols. So we have these new symbols, equals and non-equals, and we'll need the new syntax rules to be introduced. And so we have our formation rule which says that if we have two terms, alpha here and beta here, and these are just any kind of term that we want, so they could be names or they could be variables, 
then we can take the first term and the second term and place the equal sign in between them and the resulting formula will be a well-formed formula. Or we could take those two terms, alpha and beta, and put the non-equal signs between them and the resulting formula will be a well-formed formula. So this is just a formation rule for creating well-formed formulas that make use of these particular symbols. Let's look at some examples of formulas, well-formed formulas that make use of the equals and non-equal sign. So the first is A equals B. This is a name A and a name B and putting the equal sign between them results in a well-formed formula. Similarly, if we have A and B, both are terms because they're both names and putting the non-equal sign between them, it also is a well-formed formula. At three, we have X equals Y. Both are terms because variables are terms and so the result is a well-formed formula. X equals C, we have a variable here which is a term, a name here which is a term, and we can put the equal sign between them and it's a well-formed formula. At five we have LAB, this is a well-formed formula, and we have A equals B, this is also a well-formed formula as we saw from one, and so the result will be a well-formed formula when we put them together as a conjunction. At six we have AX e X equals X, and we can form the, this particular six as a well-formed formula by saying, well, if A equals A is a well-formed formula, then replacing A with X for every A would give us X equals X, and putting a universal or existential quantifier in front of this result would give us a well-formed formula. And finally, seven is a well-formed formula. We could form uh, this whole formula where this is a well-formed formula, this is a well-formed formula, and the kind of creation of the entire thing is also a well-formed formula. So these are some quick examples. So hopefully these examples will, if there was any uncertainty, help clarify things. In the case of semantics, what we're doing is using the valuation function and taking formulas as input and yielding truth values as output. And now that we have these new well-formed formulas, we need a, to modify our valuation function so that we can take identity as sentences, identity formulas, and assign them a value of true or false. One way to kind of start in thinking about this is just to define a valuation function for closed well-formed formulas. These are formulas without free variables. In a moment, I'll talk about how we can modify the valuation function so it takes into account formulas with free variables that is open well-formed formulas. But for now, let's just simply look at closed well-formed formulas. So if we have a formula that consists of two names, that is identity formula A equals B, A equals B will be true relative to the model if and only if the denotation of A relative to the model, that is the denotation of the name alpha relative to the model, is the same as the denotation of the name B relative to the model. So what the denotation, and I kind of talk about this in another video, is with respect to a name, is simply the interpretation. So another way of putting this is that if the interpretation of A is the same as the interpretation of B, then the formula A equals B is true. Otherwise, a equals B will be false. Remember that the interpretation of a name will pick out some object from the domain. So we might say that the name A, if the name A picks out one and the name B picks out, also picks out the item one from the domain, then the formula A equals B will be true. But if the interpretation of A picked out one and the interpretation of B picked out two, then the formula would be false. Alternatively, we can say that when alpha and beta are names, the formula A does not equal B is true if and only if the formula A equals B comes out as false. So it's pretty straightforward. A does not equal B when the formula A equals B is not true. All of this makes intuitive sense. If we think about names, if we take the name like let's say Superman is identical to Clark Kent, we have the name Superman and we have the name Clark Kent and they both refer to the same object. And so if we say Superman is identical to Clark Kent, 
Since the fact that Superman refers to a particular object and Clark Kent refers to a particular object and th those objects are the same object, then the formula or sentence is true. Let's look at a particular example of this. So let's take the following model where so a model consists of a domain and an interpretation function. We'll make the model relatively simple. So the domain will consist of two numbers, two and four. We'll interpret a couple names, A, B, and C. A will refer to two, B will refer to four, C will refer to two, and then we'll interpret a one place predicate which um, picks out the set that consists of the items two and four. So now let's walk through each of these examples and determine if the formula is true or false. So in the case of A equals C right here, in order to determine if this is true or not, we look at the denotation of A and see if it picks out the same object as the denotation of C. That is, we look at the interpretation of A, the interpretation of C, and see if these are the same thing. So we note that the interpretation of A is two, and the interpretation of C is two, and so the formula A equals C is true. Next, let's look at two. We have PA right here, which will come out as true because we'll note that A picks out two, and two is found in the interpretation of P. So this conjunct right here comes out as true. What we want and what's relevant for us is determining the truth value of this particular um, conjunct, the right conjunct here. So in order for this to be true, B needs to be equal, that is the denotation of B needs to be equal to the denotation of C. And we see the denotation of B is four and the denotation of C is two. And so this conjunct, the right conjunct is false. And so the entire formula here is false. What about A does not equal B? Well, in order for this to be the case, we need the value of A equals B to be false. And so it must be the case that A does not, the denotation of A does not equal the denotation of B. So let's check that. So A picks out the item two from the domain and B picks out the item four from the domain. And so since we have a two and four, since these two do not equal each other, the it is true to say that A does not equal B. So we'll say that this is true. That is since it's the case that the valuation of A equals B is false, the valuation of A does not equal B is true. Lastly, let's look at the formula. There exists an X such that X is equal to X. Now there's a couple of ways of talking about how to determine the truth value of quantified formulas, but I'm going to take a really simple route here, given this particular model. This formula we can say is true, provided there is some name we can substitute for X right there. And so if B equals B is true, or C equals C is true, or A equals A is true, then the formula EX, X equals X is true. And we'll note that if we replace X with A, we find that it is true to say that A equals A is true. And since it's true that A equals A is true, it's also true to say that there is something that is identical to itself is true. Now let's expand our valuation rule not to only take into account closed well-formed formulas, but also open well-formed formulas as well. I talked through how to do this in general in another video that I'll put in the as a link in the description below. So if you haven't checked that out or you find this particular part confusing, you'll wanna check that out before you kind of continue on with this part on semantics. So again, let's let alpha and beta be terms, but in this case, rather than letting them simply be names, we'll also allow them to be variables. And so here we're going to define a valuation function, not simply relative to a model, but relative to also a variable assignment, which is a assignment of items in the domain to particular variables. And so we say that the alpha equals beta is true if and only if the denotation of the term relative to the model and the variable assignment is the same as the denotation of the term beta relative to the model and the variable assignment. 
And if this is not the case, then the valuation relative to the model and the variable assignment is false of this particular formula. And similar to the other valuation function, if the, the formula alpha equals beta is true relative to the model and the variable assignment, if and only if alpha equals beta is false. Again, let's look at a particular example. Here we'll take a model. This time our model will be a little bit more complicated in that it will involve four items, one, two, three, four. We have some names that pick out individual items from the domain. We have two two-place predicates. Here we have EX, which we can let stand for the evens, OX, which is another one-place predicate that picks out the odds. And then we have a variable assignment, which takes variables and assigns them items from to the in the domain. So we have X refers to one, Y refers to two, and then we also have Z refers to four. So now let's consider the truth value of some formulas that are open. In the case of X equals X, in order to determine the truth value of this, we look at whether or not the denotation of X is the same as the denotation of X. And we get the denotation of X from the variable assignment. So we look and see, does GX pick out the same item each time? And the answer is yes. In the first case, GX picks out one, and in the second case, it picks out one. So there's no change in terms of how the variable assignment picks out the item or the uh, referent of a variable. So the formula X equals X is true. How about X equals Y? Again, we'll look at the denotation of each of the terms, and this is defined, and since they're both variables, this is defined by the variable assignment, and we'll note that in the variable assignment of X is one, and the variable assignment of Y is two, and so since X, since one does not equal two, the truth value of this formula is false. In the case of three, we have a conjunction here. We have EA, which is true because you'll note that a which picks out two is found in the interpretation of ex which contains two and four and so the left conjunct is true but what about y does not equal c so what we'll do here is determine if the denotation of y which is defined relative to the model and the variable assignment equals or does not equal the denotation of C. So if these two do not equal, then this right conjunct will be true. So Y is picked out by the variable assignment, GY, and that is the number two. And C is picked out by the interpretation of C, which is also true. Two, excuse me. And so since these two do, are identical to each other, this formula Y does not equal C is false. And so the entire conjunction comes out as false. Lastly, we have EX, X equals Y. To determine the truth value of this, what we're looking for is, is there a variant variable assignment? That is a way of assigning items from the domain to the variable X that would be identical to Y. What we're asking is, is there something that is identical to Y? So to do this, we first look at the denotation of Y, and that is defined by the variable assignment, which is two. And then we think about, well, how can X be assigned an item in the domain? Obviously, X is assigned a value by the variable assignment, but since this is an existentially quantified formula, what we're looking for is, is there some denotation of X? That is, can we vary the variable assignment such that it would be equal to Y? And you can kind of run through the different ways we could assign values to X and look for one that is identical to Y. So if we just use the variable assignment one, this would come out as false. That is the two would not be identical, but then we could run through all the other ways that X could be assigned a referent and provided that there is one of them such that this formula would come out as true, then the existentially quantified expression is true. And there is, if we 
let x refer to 2, then we have a case where x is identical to y. That is, the denotation of x is identical to y. And this makes intuitive sense that it would come out as true because it says there exists an item x such that x is identical to y. That is, something's identical to y, and that's the case. There is something identical to y, which is 2 here. Now that we've covered the semantics, it's worthwhile to look at how we would use uh, formulas that involve identity in a proof. There are two different derivation rules, and both involving the equal sign. Here we'll introduce interlam rules, that is introduction and elimination rules. So this would be part of a derivation system that is an interlam system. The first is identity introduction, which would allow us to introduce into the proof identity formulas. And the other is identity elimination, which would make use of identity formulas in reasoning to a formula in a proof. The first one we'll look at is identity introduction. And this is pretty straightforward. It just simply says that at any point in the proof, you can write a alpha equals alpha for any name you want. So let's look at an example. The example is that we have a derivation of for all x, x equals x. At line one, we have an assumption. At line two, we are using this identity introduction rule, which says that we could write a equals a. We could have written b equals b, c equals c, anything we want provided it's one name is identical to the same name. And then the rest of the proof is as follows, but this is important. What's important here is our, that at any point in the proof, we can simply write A equals A, or B is equals B, or C equals C. The next rule is identity elimination. And this says that if you have a formula alpha equals beta or A equals B, and another formula that contains one of those names, then you can substitute one name for the other. So you could substitute a for b in phi, or you could substitute b for a in phi. Let's look at some examples of this. So I want, what, before I do that, one thing I want to kind of point out is that the basic intuition behind this rule is that if a and b, the names a and b, refer to the same thing, then whatever is true of a is true of b and vice versa, that you, you can substitute the names for each other. Now there are some problems with this particular rule, but we'll sort of ignore those here. And if you're interested, I could cover them in a different video. So here's the example. We have alpha equals, or A equals B, L, A, C. And then we're gonna reason to L, B, C. So A equals B is a premise. L, A, C is also a premise. And then we can reason to L, B, C where here we are substituting A. We're replacing this A that's found in two with B. So we're taking the A that's found in two and saying, well, since A refers to the same object as B, we can put B here, we can reason to line three. And since this makes use of two formulas, we need to cite both of them and then indicate that this is by identity elimination. Here's another example. Let's say we have for all x, LXA, and then we have this identity statement, A equals B, and then we want to derive AX, LX, B. So we set up the proof here, and we have this identity statement at line two. We also have a formula that contains one of the names, and the name is A, and we make use of the identity elimination rule here, which says that since we have A at line one, and we know that A is identical to B, we can replace this A with B. So we can write a new formula that simply takes that A and replaces it with B right here. So the last thing I wanna talk about with respect to identity, and th this again is just a really basic introduction to the use of identity and predicate logic is translation. What the identity and non-identity symbols allow you to do is take a number of natural language utterances and translate them in a more crisp, evident way. And we'll look at some of that here. So I think there are three basic types of sentences or formulas that identity does a very good job of expressing. The first are numerical propositions or sentences. 
sentences like there is at least, um, you know, five apples or there is at least n things that have this particular property. Um, other numerical propositions include there's at most five things that have a particular property and there's exactly five things that have a particular property. So if you wanted to say there's exactly five apples, you would struggle to translate that using the existential universal quantifier because the existential quantifier says that there's at least one thing that has a particular property. It doesn't specify the exact number. The other sentences that identity is helpful in translating are sentences that have exceptive phrases. So if you wanted to say like all movies are, all romance movies are exciting, but you wanted to exclude one, you wanted to say except this particular one over here and kind of call it out by name or call out a particular subclass of romance movies that you don't particularly like, then identity is helpful here. So if you wanted to say all presidents are great except for these five, then using identity, the identity and non-identity symbols are helpful in doing such a thing. The last one are superlatives. So if you wanted to say something was the best or the worst or the greatest or, you know, that, then identity is also helpful here. What I will focus on are these numerical propositions. If you're interested in translations of uh, acceptive phrases and superlatives, you could always reach out to me and I'm happy to maybe make a video about those. But I want to keep the whole video pretty basic about how to do some translations. And there's a lot to chew on with respect to numerical propositions along. So let's go through the three different types of numerical propositions. These are at least n, that is at least a certain number of things have a particular property, so at least five things have a property. At most n rp, that is at most five things or four things or three things have a particular property. And then there are exactly three things or two things or one thing that have a particular property. And we'll look at some concrete examples. Uh, these are, there are at least two zombies, at least three zombies, at most one zombie, at most two zombies, and then exactly one zombie, and there are exactly two zombies. We'll translate each one of these sentences. So let's start with the sentence, there are at least two zombies. So one thing to note is that this sentence asserts the existence of two zombies. It says there are at least two zombies. So one thought is to say, well, maybe we can translate this simply by using two existential quantifiers. And so we might try to translate there are at least two zombies by writing the following. There exists an X and there exists a Y such that X is a zombie and Y is a zombie. This would not be a correct translation because the fact that there are two existential quantifiers there doesn't guarantee that there are two distinct zombies. This sentence can be, or this formula can be true provided there is one single zombie. And what we want is to say that there is two zombies and they are not the same zombie. So to ensure that there are at least two items, two different things that have this property of being zombie, it's necessary to ensure that the items that are in the scope of the quantifier uh, are not the same thing. So we want to make this evident. And the way to do this is again to use two existential quantifiers and say that both of the things picked out by the existential quantifier, the X and the Y, both of them are zombies, but we also want to say that they are not identical to each other. So we can write EX, EY, so there, are, exist two, uh, there exists an X and there exists a Y, X is a zombie and Y is a zombie. And again, at this point, we don't have enough to assert that there are two different things. It could be one, the thing picked out by X and the thing picked out by Y are the same thing. But in order to ensure there is a, these two things are not the same thing, we can say that X is not identical to Y. So this well-formed formula says there's a zombie X, a zombie Y, and the zombie X is not the same thing, is not numerically identical to the zombie Y. And so this ensures that these, we have two distinct zombies here. It may be the case that we have more than two distinct zombies, but we have at least two. So for example, if we had 10 zombies, this formula would still be true because there would be, there's at least one X and at least one Y such that X and Y are not identical to each other and those things are zombies. And that would be satisfied by, let's say having five or 10 distinct, in, distinct zombies. 
All right, now let's look at the sentence, there are at least three zombies. We can use the same strategy that we used before to translate at least two zombies. What we'll do here is say that there are three quantifiers. So there exists an X, exists a Y, exists a Z. All three of these things, X, Y, and Z are zombies. But to ensure that there are three of them, we'll say that X is not identical to Y, X is not identical to Z, and Y is not identical to Z. So this ensures that the three objects picked out by the existential quantifiers that are zombies are not the same thing. Again, there could be four or five or six zombies that would make this true, but we have to have at least three in order to make this formula true. And the mode sort of general, and this mode generalizes. If we wanna say at least one zombie, we can do this with EX, ZX. We have our uh, expression for two, three, and then we have a way of stating that it at least n zombies, a way of translating this into the language of predicate logic. So if we wanted to say there's at least, let's say, 17 zombies, we would need 17 existential quantifiers, so x sub 17, and then just sort of proceed to write out zx sub 1, zx sub 2 for each one of these bound variables, and then make sure there are the items that we are talking about are not the same by using the not equal sign which, with respect to each one of the bound variables. So now we looked at how to translate sentences of the form at least n things are p, we can turn to the sentences of the form at most n things are p. So let's consider there's only one or there's at most one zombie. It's helpful to think about what is exactly being asserted here. So imagine an individual tech and say, let's say he says, there's at most one zombie. Tech is not asserting that there are any zombies. He's just saying, if there are any, there's no more than one zombie. In understanding tech in this way, if he's saying it is not the case that there are at least two zombies, one thing to note is that we already have a way of translating sentences of the form, there are at least two zombies, or there are at least some number of things that have a particular property, because we just looked at at least n number of things are p. And so if we're simply denying that, we, can, we have an easy way of translating sentences of the form, there are at most one zombie or two zombies or three zombies. So to put this again, we already have a method of translating sentences like there are at least n things that are p, and we can use this method to translate for sentences of the form there are at most n things that are p. And so let's look at those examples. So again, if the sentence there is at most one zombie says the same thing as it's not the case that there are at least two zombies, we can start our translation process by first translating this, the form, the sentence, there are at least two zombies. So let's start by translating this sentence. That translation, which we've already looked at, we simply say that there are two existential quantifiers. Both of them pick out zombies and the item that is a zombie that they both pick out are not identical to each other. So this translates, there are at least two zombies, but remember, to say that there is at most one zombie is to say the same thing as it is not the case that, not the case that there are at least two zombies. So we can take this formula and simply negate it. And now we have a translation of, now that we've negated it, a translation of there is at most one zombie. Some people find this particular formula hard to read, so a more common way of translating it is to make use of some equivalence rules and to translate it as follows. This formula says for every X and for every Y, if X and Y are a zombie, then X is identical to Y. So the idea here is that let's say one of these variables picks out an item, and let's call that item X, or let's call that item tech. Then what it also says is that for every other item that is also a zombie, that item is going to be identical to tech. And so if there are any zombies, and let's say there are one, that one item 
every other zombie is going to be identical to that particular zombie. And if that's the case, then there is at most one zombie. It's not committed to saying that there are any zombies, but it is committed to saying that if there are any, then that zombie will be identical to every zombie, in which case there would only be one zombie. We can use this same strategy to translate sentences like there are at most two zombies. We can start by simply writing that it is not the case that there are at least three zombies. And then we can translate this maybe more clearly into the following formula. Or we can translate this to the second formula straight away. It's worth pausing and thinking a little bit about this second formula here. It consists of three quantifiers and what we're saying with the sentences, there's at most two zombies. So if you have a general strategy, if it says there are most two zombies, then you'll need three universal quantifiers. If you had at most three zombies, then you'd need four universal quantifiers. In each case, we want to say that X is a zombie, Y is a zombie, and Z is a zombie. But then the important part comes in this consequent of the conditional right here. In order for this consequent to be true, one of these disjuncts must be true. Now, if they were all true, then this X, Y, and Z would pick out one thing. It would pick out the same zombie in which case it would be true that there are at most two zombies because there would be one zombie and so there are no more than two zombies. But let's imagine, let's say this disjunct is false. So we can imagine a zombie here and a zombie here and this one's picked out by X and this one's picked out by Y and we'll say that they're not identical. So this disjunct is false. In order for the consequent to be true, we need one of these disjuncts to be true. Now they both can't be true because if they were both true, then X would equal Z, X would equal Z, and Y would equal Z, in which case it couldn't be the case that X and Y don't equal each other. So it can only be the case that if we take x equal y to be false, then only one of these can be the case. So let's say x does not equal z. Let's say this disjunct is false. And instead y equals z. If y equals z, then what we're saying is that for every other zombie, for every other thing that is a zombie, that thing will be identical to y. In which case, we're saying that there aren't any other zombies out there. Anything else that would have the property of being a zombie would simply just be Y. And so this would ensure that there are at most two items. There's X, which is a zombie, and Y is a zombie. So it's made true by this sort of scenario where there are two zombies there. We already mentioned when there's one zombie and two zombies, but we can do this for any number. We simply take whatever number we want to talk about, let's say six, and we'll add seven universal quantifiers, indicate that each one of the variables that is bound by these quantifiers has the property of being a zombie. And then we'll create this elaborate disjunction where each one of the things is identical to the other and in which case, in order for this to be true, it'll guarantee that we have at most six zombies there. The last formula I want to look at is sentences where we want to say a certain exact number of things have a particular property. One way of expressing that there is exactly n number of things or items from the domain that have a particular property P is to say that there is at least a certain number of things that have a particular property and there's at most a certain number of things, the same number of things that have that property. So for example, suppose we say that text says that there are at least five apples and at most five apples. So what he's committed to saying is there's at least five, there actually exists some apple number of apples and there's at least five of them and there is no more than five. And if he's saying that, then 
he's actually saying that there are exactly five apples. And since we have a method already for translating formulas that say something like there is at least n p's and we have a method for translating there is at most n p's, then we can translate sentences that there is exactly n number of items that have the property p. And so we'll simply take our two methods and combine them together in a conjunction. So let's look at an example. The first example we'll look at is there is exactly one zombie. We might think, well, I can translate there's at least one zombie by writing ex zx. And I can translate there's at most one zombie by writing for all x, for all y, if x is z and y is z, then, then x is identical to y. And we can take these two formulas and put them together as a conjunction. So this long formula here, the conjunction says there exists a zombie. So we're asserting that there's at least one and that every zombie that exists is identical to the one that exists. There's a way of cleaning or simplifying this formula and I won't go into how this is exactly done, but we can rewrite this long conjunction in a simpler form as follows. We can say that there exists an X such that for all Y, X is a zombie. And then for all things that are zombies, X is identical to Y. So we know that there's at least one thing that's a zombie. And then for all other things that we might predicate the property of being a zombie, that th those things would be identical to Y. So this would guarantee us that there's exactly one zombie because we have at least one. And then for any others that we might attribute the property of being a zombie, it would have the property of being identical to that one thing that exists. Let's consider there are exactly two zombies. Again, we wanna say two things here. We wanna say that there exists an X and exists a Y that are both zombies and they're not identical to each other. So we wanna assert that there are at least two zombies and we also want to say that there are no more zombies. That is for everything else, and we'll say this is Z, if that thing has the property of being a zombie, then that object will be identical to one of the two things that are zombies, but are not identical to each other. And so we want to make add in the statement that will ensure that there are no more than two zombies, but there are at least two zombies. We can write this out as follows. The first thing we'll want to say is there exists an X and there exists a Y such that X is a zombie, Y is a zombie, and these two things are not identical to each other. This will ensure that there's at least two zombies. So we have this on our table. Now we'll make use of the universal quantifier and this expression over here, uh, and we are missing a parentheses, to ensure that there are no more than two zombies. So this says that for all Z, if Z is a zombie, then that item will either be identical to X, so it'll be identical to the zombie picked out by X, or it will be identical to the zombie picked out by Y. So this will ensure that there are no more than two zombies. And if we know that there are a at least two zombies and no more than two zombies, then we have a formula that expresses the truth conditions of the sentence. There are exactly two zombies. And similar to the prior ones, we can extend this strategy for translating sentences that there are exactly n number of items that have a particular property of P for any number of items. So we have our strategy for there being one zombie, two zombies, but we can also use the same strategy for any number, we could say eight zombies. We would make sure we had eight existential quantifiers here, and then we would wanna list each one of these variables that bind the quantifiers and ensure that they're all distinct from each other by using the non-identity sign and then we would want to ensure that there are no more than eight by saying that for any other object that has the property of being a zombie, that item is going to be identical to one of the eight 
items that have the property of being a zombie. So there's certainly more that can be said about numerical identity and the use of identity in predicate logic, but I won't go into that here. What I will say though is that one book that was pretty helpful for me in formulating a lot of the translations at least was this book by Daniel Bonovac and I had a couple other authors on here. It's called Logic Sets and Functions. It's actually kind of a hard book to track down. I tried to find a picture of this book and I couldn't actually find one. I just took the picture of the book that I had. And when I went on to Amazon, I saw there was a copy, but it was 200 some dollars. So if you can track down this book, the part on translating formulas with identity, I think is was very helpful. There were some small mistakes here and there or things that could be improved, but this is, I think, a great book for translating formulas that have followed identity. So if that's a part that you have questions on, this is a book worth checking out.